So I want to go over a little bit about what we're doing to fertilize our garden um, and just go over the whole process up to this point in the season. It's uh, just the end of May, it's almost Memorial Day. And so we'll do different things based off the time of the year. But I want to go over what we've done to get us to this point today, which is Memorial Day weekend. So, so far to get us to this point, we've done a one soil test and we've done one feeding of a compost extract, a fish, a liquid fish product and a liquid kelp product. Um, and that's it. And we're actually getting ready to do another soil test because we've had a bunch of rain and we know that a lot of the nutrients have been leached out because after the first soil test, we do a top dress, then you get a bunch of rain and then you're gonna get a lot of that to leach out. And so we wanna replenish that in the soil, but we also want to keep things moving along. And so we do a little bit of extra feeding with a little liquid fish, little liquid uh, kelp and a compost extract. And I'll go over those products that we've used up to this point. So as far as the soil test goes and the top dress, um, basically we take a sample out of here if for anybody that's never soil tested we get two cups out of here we send it to the lab they send us results back um, we look at it and based off whatever deficiencies or excesses there are that's what dictates what we do from that point on um, whether we are adding trying to add certain nutrients whether it's macronutrients which are the big ones or micronutrients which are the small ones um, or sometimes we'll have excesses which we see that a lot with a lot of our customer base and we want to bring those excesses down and so you don't want to add anything that has any of that and have the plants and or uh, natural uh, like leaching and rain and things like that get rid of those uh, excesses um, and, and again based off the soil test we look at that see what's there and we're either um, top dressing to add or we're holding off on something to make sure it uh, gets leached out or lowers um, and that's really it. It's a pretty simple process. There's multiple companies that do quality soil tests. We use a &L Labs. Um, a lot of people like Logan Labs. There's nothing wrong with either one of them. If you're a um, home gardener, no matter what you're growing, um, both of these labs and most other labs will give you recommendations for an extra five to 20 bucks or something like that. I think it's totally worth it to do that. Um, after you do that over multiple seasons, you'll start to kind of see what, you, you know, your, what works in your garden and you should get to a point where you don't need those recommendations. We currently give recommendations if you get a soil test through us and we use our numbers that we have in-house um, to help balance your soil. And we also take into account what you're growing, how you're growing it, things like that. And so it, a lot of people aren't soil testing and I feel like they find it as too daunting and it's really not daunting at all. You just jump in, do it, and you'll never, once you see the results, you'll never look back. Um, one caveat to all of this is what we see a lot of these, um, at least here in Oklahoma, a lot of the um, county extension soil test or university soil test, things like that, they don't test for a lot. And so I tell everybody, I consider them toilet paper. Um, they're just not very useful at all. Um, you want to make sure, again, we use A&L Labs, Logan Labs is uh, quality as well, and there's a few other ones out there. You want to make sure that it's an extensive soil test and testing for all of the things that you can afford to test for. Um, you know, spending 10 or $15 at your county extension office versus spending $50 at a, a lab that tests for more, it's definitely worth the extra. And a lot of times you can get away with doing it once a year. We'll, we do it multiple times a year in our garden just to be safe, just to make sure we're on top of our game and to make sure we you know, stay on top of any deficiencies. But we also, this is what we do. We don't have a budget. You know, I'm not like, oh, I can only afford a soil, one soil test this year. I mean, I can afford 10 soil tests this year because we're gonna pull that data and it's gonna help us and our customer base out long term. So yes, the money is a factor, um, but if money is the biggest factor, I would go to a quality lab and spend a little bit extra and get one test versus having multiple tests from say a county extension office or something like that. Um, other than that, it's really a basic process and um, getting your, it, it's the best way to get your garden from pretty good to start getting it to great. There are other things that you obviously need to look at. Um, organic matter is important. Our tests we do, that has that in it, some don't. Um, microbes, which a lot of people are overlooking, um, I feel that that's important. The diversity of microbes is important. Your compost source, if you're adding compost to your garden, that's important. The microbial diversity of that compost, that's important. But overall, start with the basic soil test, 
get that going and then you can delve into these other things that will help your garden just flourish. So after we've done the soil test and we've top dressed, um, we basically let that ride out in our garden for about four or five weeks and we haven't done any feedings. And we did just have a lot of rain over the past week, like a lot, a lot, like flooding, flood warnings were coming up on my phone, that much rain. Um, and so at this point, we wanna do another soil test, which is just the same soil test as before. If we have excesses or with deficiencies, we'll correct you know, what we need to correct. But then we do need to look at starting to do some light feedings. Now that we're starting to get plant production, you can see behind me, um, tomatoes and squash and zucchinis are coming in really, I don't know how we're gonna contain this bed because it's Memorial Day weekend. And I think by probably the end of June, the tomatoes will be eight foot to this top right here. So that's an issue, but <laughs> that's a good problem to have. But since we're starting to get this growth um, and we had a lot of rain, we are starting to do some light feedings. Like I mentioned, that is compost extract and that is fish fertilizer and that is a, a liquid kelp fertilizer. And that's it so far. Um, and I'm gonna go over the reasons why we do those. And it's a real basic thing. Um, you can get these products pretty much anywhere in America. Um, and for that fact, around most of the planet. Um, so they, they really work well in a garden. They're cheap, they're easy to do. You get good results with them. Um, and they fit well with most uh, vegetable gardening programs. So when it comes to a compost extract, um, I'll link a video below in the description um, that we made showing you how to make one, the benefits of it, all of that. Um, the short is we want to add a diversity of microbes to the garden to help cycle nutrients. And that's basically it. Um, and so your parent material, which would be the compost, is very important. Um, if your compost is mostly just bacteria, well, you're just mostly going to add bacteria. And so then, what eats the bacteria? Nothing, because you didn't add anything. Um, unless it's already in your soil, it stops it there. And so what we want to do is we want to have all of those different levels of microbes in our soil so that we increase nutrient cycling. And so if you don't know what nutrient cycling is, all that means is the microbes eat organic stuff and they poop it out and it's fertilizer for your plants. And that's it. And we want to increase that and make it as maxed out as possible. Um, and the easiest way is to use a BioComplete compost. Um, I can link that down there. We sell them. There's uh, people that are making it now all across America and there's different companies popping up, which is awesome um, that that's really catching on. But it's the um, best way to get the most diversity with the least amount of work and the least amount of money. Uh, making a compost tea, you know, I know you're a lot, oh, I make teas, I make teas, I made teas for a decade. And I use a microscope to scope them. But they're really hard to predict and they're really hard to replicate and make them the same every single time. And with the compost extract, your only thing you have to worry about is if your parent material under a microscope has everything in it that you want, your extract's solid and that's it, done. And so that's why we stick with the BioComplete compost. Um, it just makes it easy. Now, that being said, changing it up and throwing in a worm casting extract because there's diversity is key. Um, so if you have multiple different parent stocks of compost and worm castings and things like that, switch it up to get the biggest diversity you can. And that's what we will be doing here. But up to this point, all we've done is one compost extract with a BioComplete compost um, to, to start upping our um, microbe game in the soil. Um, and so, yes, over time, you should start getting diversity in your soil naturally. But this is a brand new garden, and so we're trying to speed that up anyways. Um, but even if this is an aged garden and we have this, these beds are two, three years old, we're still going to grab our microscope, we're still going to take a sample, and we're still going to look at the microbes and say, hey, we don't see a lot of this, this, or this. And so, hey, an extract would be beneficial. Or um, we have these worm castings and we know that they, you know, they have a lot of uh, fungal activity and that would be beneficial. And so we, it, it's a constant process that's gonna ebb and flow. Um, and your microbial diversity and type of microbe is gonna change based off of the seasons. I mean, we just had a week worth of rain. And so I know in our soil, 
um, it's probably going to have some anaerobes in there. Um, and so we'll see some rotifers and ciliates and things like that, and that's just going to be natural this time of year. I can't block the rain out here from over the beds. Uh, that's just, it's impossible. And so there are those natural processes that are going to happen and the anaerobes are going to happen as part of those natural processes. But we, want, we don't want to steer it that direction completely. We want to just keep trying to stay um, with aerobic microbial diversity in the soil. And that's why we're doing the extracts. Again, I will link the video on how to make the extracts um, in the description below. It's a super simple process. Larry at the store here did a great job. He actually just uh, graduated from Soil Food Web Schools and uh, it's fresh on his brain. I haven't studied that in over a decade. And we're in Oklahoma and at noon on Saturdays, the tornado sirens get tested. So I guess we'll cut and I'll get back to talking. Okay. Tornado siren stopped. Let's continue. Um, so, I mentioned liquid seaweed. This is what we use. Liquid seaweed products are available at pretty much all big box stores. You can order on a line, you can order it from our website. I'm sure you can order it off the Amazons and things like that. Um, for people that are new to gardening, why do we use liquid seaweed? Um, I've been using it for since I've been gardening. Uh, and basically the short of it is, it contains micronutrients and it has growth hormones. Um, there are other things that can be purported as it, you know, you can Google it and you can get a list of 50 things. But for me, micronutrients, growth hormones, and it should be bioavailable so that the plant can uh, take it up right then. And so as I spoke to earlier, as you need the microbes to make uh, your top dresses bioavailable, this is already a bioavailable. Uh, uh, already has a bioavailable nutrient, so when you give it, it should be pretty much an instant response within a day or so. Um, and that's really the short of using a liquid seaweed product. I like to couple that with liquid fish, so um, let's also talk about that product that we're using as well. All right, so now liquid fish. This is a liquid fish product we use, Neptune's Harvest. Been using it for a lot of years. Um, liquid fish products are available in most big box stores, and so that's why I like using them, I like showing people how to use them because you can get it pretty much anywhere. You don't have to buy it from us. Um, so the benefits of using a liquid fish product are the macronutrients, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, the potassium. That's the biggest benefit. Um, there is data out there that shows that it could help feed some microbes. I don't use it for that, but that could be a thing. Um, that's something for you to delve into deeper. That's not really anything that I want to talk about in this video. Um, something it does also contain though is amino acids. And amino acids can help the plant save energy. Um, and so it can just overall help the uh, growth of the plant and the health of the plant because it's saving some of those um, processes that the plant would normally have to have. It doesn't have to do those anymore. Um, and that's really the short of using liquid fish. Biggest thing is those nutrients and it's an easy, cheap way um, to give your plants nutrients uh, when they're lacking and like for right now in our instance we are waiting for a soil test to get back it's going to be two weeks i don't know what to top dress but we know we need to feed our plants and so that's why we start this regimen now and as again as the plants get bigger and as we start producing fruit things like that they're going to be more um, they're going to be hungrier and uh, it's going to we're going to need to be more intensive about feeding the plants um, and so that's, you know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's an easy, easy way um, doing these to really beef up any garden and the end results you're gonna get. So now I wanna talk a little bit about the use rate on these products. And I'll talk specifically about the products that I have here that we're using in our garden behind me. Um, now with the compost extract, again, I'm gonna link the video in the description below and you can uh, get all the details on that. Uh, how many cups in a five gallon bucket, uh, you know, it's, not very many, um, but I'll link that and so that, that'll be there for you to peruse later. Um, but with a liquid fish and the liquid kelp, those use rates vary. I see people use as little as a tablespoon and up to two to three ounces a gallon. Uh, we are in the, this last feeding for uh, example, we use one ounce of each, one ounce of liquid kelp, one ounce of uh, liquid fish per gallon. And right now we don't have our feed tank set up. Uh, we actually have the drum and I have the pump but I haven't put it all together yet. And so what we did uh, for this first feeding is we just mixed it in five gallon buckets and we went in and hand water fed here. This is how untechnical we were. We have this. And just at the base of the plants that we want to feed, 
we're just giving them some. And then we came back and watered um, to, to soak it in. That's not ideal. That's not what we want to do long term. We want to do the feed tank with the pump so we can go and do everything. But we've had a lot going on. And that's where we're at at this point. But it does work. And that works in every garden. I've done that in multiple gardens. I don't have a... This is our store. In my home gardens, I don't have a feed tank. I don't have like a 275 gallon IBC tote up against my back porch. And then I'm like got plumbed in with a diaphragm pump and feeding all my plants. Mixing up in a bucket and watering it in every week or every other week is just fine. It's, it's, it's great for most people, for almost all people actually, <laughs> that are home gardening. You really don't need any more than that. Um, and that's really there, all there is to the feedings. Now, um, I guess the duration, or not the duration, uh, how often you're feeding is definitely something that comes up. I, now that I'm getting older, I am the less is more type person. Unless I start seeing issues, we're not gonna feed any more than once a week. Maybe we do every other week. We're gonna base that off rains and weathering and things like that, size of the plants. Um, we're also gonna continually be getting uh, soil tests. But in your situation, if you're not getting a soil test once a month or every six weeks or whatever, then once a week is pretty good. And one to two ounces of uh, any of these liquid products per gallon is really all you need. Um, again, soil test along with the top dress to just get your bases covered. And then this is just a little boost. So you shouldn't really have to be using a ton of it. Um, if you're relying on that solely, I would say defer to a soil test and then pull back on this. The soil test is gonna pay for itself long-term. Um, it, it's just, it's the key to really making gardening a lot easier. Um, and, and just moving forward, that's the direction I would go if I wasn't already doing soil tests. I can't stress that enough. Okay, so it's gonna be hot and spicy today and I'm starting to get sweaty. And so I'm gonna try to wrap this up. I think I made it longer than it probably needed to be anyways because we're, I'm only talking about using three products in the garden and it didn't seem like it should have taken as long as it did for me to film this, but hopefully it's useful information. Um, and uh, follow along in the garden as it progresses and we will talk about things we're doing in the garden and show you things we're doing in the garden um, whether it's fertilization, whether it's the irrigation, we already have an irrigation video up. We're going to do um, one on our feed tank that we're building, um, pruning the tomatoes. We're going to do that this week and show you how we're doing that and to train them up this wall so that by the end of the summer, they're probably going to be 10 to 12 foot tall, which will look amazing on Instagram. Speaking of, if you're not following us on Instagram, you should follow us on Instagram. If you're not currently subscribed to our YouTube, you should subscribe to our YouTube. If you like seeing the progress of the garden, but also enjoy seeing somebody just do the stupidest shit ever, you should also follow us on TikTok. Um, I hope your garden is flourishing. I hope that some of this content helps you. And if you have any questions, go in the comments below and uh, we're just going to keep gardening and uh, sharing the experience with you.